to see you and wonderful to see this remarkable panel and be part of this really special event. Um, I, I've been so impressed with, with what you've created with you versus the virus, the kind of activation, the collaboration, the quality of the outputs, the, the outputs that you have produced through the initiatives that have been created here make me incredibly hopeful for what comes next. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about. I want to talk, and we all, this panel wants to discuss a little bit, how do we take this kind of capability, this capacity that you have created and move it to the next level of development? You have, you, you've done an amazing thing, you know, getting together imaginative in, individual, NGOs, startups, policymakers, and corporations all coming together to find solutions for a problem that no one can solve on their own. And so that kind of impact requires that we all come together and do exactly what you've been doing. And to me, you have created the perfect platform for what's next. And so beyond dealing with the virus, we now have this extraordinary amount of uh, piece of work to do, where as we go forward, we actually have to focus on how do we preserve life itself on this planet. And so. Let me build on that notion a little bit. I want to provoke you a little bit, and then let's all have a conversation and talk about how can we build on the capabilities that we have here. So I'm going to try to uh, share some slides with all of you. Um, let me do that. Uh, here we go. Uh, and there we are. And we should have the slide. All right, so okay. here we are. Welcome to the regenerative era is what I like to, how I would like to frame this effort. Um, let me see that. So here, here's, a, here's a kind of provocative start. So this is from a few weeks ago from the Guardian where it says the Arctic is in a death spiral. How much longer will it exist? The region is unraveling faster than anyone could have once predicted, but there may still be time. So we're, in, we're inundated with messages like that. Uh, you know, this is from, oops, what's going on here? We are moving quickly into a space where I don't want to be. So here we go. So what I was saying is that here are these kind of messages. We are inundated with things like this comes from the economists. The Greenland ice sheet has melted past the point of no return. You know, that the Arctic, the Antarctica is, is warming three times faster than, than the rest of the world. And the underlying message is there may still be time to act. Why, what has happened? Why are we experiencing all these natural phenomena that are out of control? Well, for the duration of human presence on this planet, our atmosphere has been between somewhere between 170 and 300 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that has been there for as long as humanity has existed on this planet, long before actually, for, for several millions of years before. And in 1950, because of our industrial activity, it broke through the ceiling of 300 parts per million. And we have now reached 417 parts per million. That was back in May. The, the, the planet has not seen that kind of atmosphere for more than 3 million years. Three million years ago, when the atmosphere was at that level of CO2, the, the, the temperatures were about two to three degrees warmer, and the oceans were 50 meters higher than they are today. So that's basically what's baked in. But the, the, the really important thing for us to remember is not only have we reached this extraordinary ceiling of 417 parts per million, but that 1,000 gigatons of CO2 is persistent up in the atmosphere. It just sits there. And you referenced that a little bit earlier about how you know, we actually have to move to something to bring this down. We have, if, if we all start driving, you know, non-polluting vehicles and we produce non-polluting uh, kind of electricity and, and energy, it doesn't change the reality of this 417 and growing part of, of, of atmospheric CO2. These thousand gigatons are stuck up there. CO2 is a very persistent molecule and will be there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Now, another thing about this CO2 is that not only does it sit in the atmosphere, but it's absorbed by the oceans. A third of the CO2, the overproduction of CO2 that we produce gets absorbed by the oceans, which then acidify. Too much CO2 in the oceans creates uh, uh, a carbonic acid, which means that in the next, if we don't change, by the end of the century, the oceans will be 170% more acidic than they are today, which is simply too acidic. 
for, for life in the oceans. Think about that, right? This is the moment. Now, half of our, our oxygen comes from the oceans, right? It, it, the phytoplankton produces over 50% of, of the oxygen we have. And since 1951, when I was born, we have lost 40% of that phytoplankton. Every single, every second breath each one of us takes comes from the ocean. And yet this is the impact that the CO2 that's in the atmosphere has. And I just wanted to point that out that the kind of innovation we need is not just to draw this stuff down just because we need to breathe better here. It's because it has this incredible impact on the oceans. So I want to leave you with that kind of consciousness as we move into why this regenerative economy, this regenerative era is so fundamental now is uh, uh, Carter Bay says we have to sort of take in a, a, con um, a, a consciousness that says, you know, stop thinking about the summer as the warmest or the smokiest or the stormiest of the last 125 years. Think of it as the coolest, the least stormy the least smoky of the coming 125 years. We need to step into this moment in reality, right? So um, the, the point then that I wanted to end this section with is that it's not about there may still be time to act. This is the moment to act. It is time to act. This may, this may well be our only time to act. So it, it, this is the background to then looking at how do we shift into an entirely different era. We need to switch out of where we have been and move into what in this context I'd like to call the regenerative era. Now, there's some really interesting signals. The, the, uh, the, the head of the Bank of England says, if you ignore climate as a company, you're gonna go bankrupt. Banks are signing up to that, to the tune of trillions of dollars of saying, we are gonna shift our investments towards these kind of UN backed climate policy supporting kind of investments. Um, the World Economic Forum spends time on it. Um, Morgan Stanley says it's, good, it's going to cost $50 trillion, but of course, something that costs $50 trillion means it's an economic reality of $50 trillion moving into this kind of new reality, right? That's where the investments are going to be. That's where the work is going to be. So just as a kind of context, I want to point out that throughout human, you know, modern human history, we have been transformed by technologies that have helped us move into the, sort of a, the agriculture era, into the industrial era, into the digital era, right? Technology has driven the, 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 the transformation of human civilization of how we go about our sort of economic reality, our way of life. What has happened, that red line is that nature now says stop. <clears throat> and we are from here on out going to be transformed by nature itself. Again, right? Back when we were in the caves, nature was fundamental to our life. It's coming back and it's going to be the foundation to everything we do. And that's why we call it the regenerative economy. It's related to the concepts of circular economy, of zero carbon or carbon removal, and then of ecosystem restoration. We have to fight back in that. And there's money going there, right? So there are there's a, an economic context that allows us to move into that. And every industry is going to have to move into that. That's the transformational moment that we're now in. And I'll go a little bit more deeply into that. So, my proposed uh, suggestion is that we are in a time of moonshots. A moonshot is something where you say, we're gonna go to the moon. We have no idea how we're gonna get there, but we will do it. And people come, to, come together. They don't know the exact solutions, but things start happening at the, the magnitude and the scale that is required. So in terms of the moonshots around climate, there's something called Project Drawdown, which I think is a great framework to start to, to sort of focus our attention. Where can we put in our work? Where can we get innovation going? Where can we put our investments going? I encourage everyone to look at it. It's a fantastic project that really defines the spaces, the areas where there'll be the greatest impact in terms of drawing down CO2 from the atmosphere. Over 240 global companies have already made a commitment to go 100% renewable. And from everything I've said so far, you know that I don't think that's enough, right? Renewable is not actually what's going to get us there because it's not drawing down CO2, right? But it's still good to know, right? It's an important first step and they're important companies. Thank you very much. Their, their consciousness is starting to shift in that. And speaking of companies, some of them are really stepping into it. So this is a very recent note to the, the company from the CEO and president of Walmart who says that we're gonna be moving to this regenerative uh, uh, orientation. So, 
sustainability, we've done that for 15 years, it's not enough. It's not going to get us there. And that's important. When leaders of companies start stepping in and say things like working with our supply chains, all right, so there's the collaborative aspect, customers, NGOs, and others, we hope to play a part in transforming the world's supply chains to be more regenerative, right? There are the important propositions, the important positioning. Regenerating means decarbonizing operations and eliminating waste. The world must reduce, avoid, and remove greenhouse gas emissions. No longer is it enough to slow down climate change and protect what we have left. As a society, we are at an inflection point. As a society, we're at an inflection point. If we don't act now, we may not have an opportunity to do something later. It's time. Similarly, Google has already committed to um, you know, take care of its carbon legacy. That's really important. And they've committed to being carbon free by 2030. So right now they're offsetting their carbon, but they're still producing stuff that uses up a lot of, that, you know, puts out a lot of carbon in the atmosphere. And then they kind of offset it. They want to be fundamentally uh, carbon free 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days uh, a year. So these are incredibly important commitments. And to me, they are signals for the kind of people that were part of EU versus the virus to step in, to do things. This is the opening for innovators, for policymakers to step in and say, okay, you're committed to that, let's make that work. Similarly, Microsoft, they're going to be carbon negative by 2030, really important, carbon, not carbon neutral, carbon negative. They're spending lots of attention on saying, what do we need to do as a company to draw down carbon? They have an, an innovation fund. They have an internal carbon tax. If you're a manager at Microsoft and you want to fly in an airplane, you have to pay a tax if you could, if you could take the train or if you could go in another way to, to, to do the same thing. And it goes into that innovation fund. They're doing all kinds of interesting things with their products where they are stepping into their relationships with the customers and say, we're committed. And we're also working with you if you're committed to these kind of targets to join us and do these kind of things. SAP is, of course, perfectly uh, um, placed to really get involved in this, right? They're in all these different companies managing supply chains, mostly around financial type uh, or orientations. Why not add the CO2 to the, uh, as, as a fundamental thing that needs to be tracked, traced, and managed? So. Alliances, you remember I made the point about how important collaborations is. And again, Microsoft is doing something really interesting together with a whole bunch of companies called Transform to Net Zero. And here's the positioning from the Chief Environmental Officer, Lucas Joppa, and I suggest you check him out. Uh, he has done some amazing videos, but here's a, a, an important sentence with a view to go uh, beyond the current COVID crisis, right? EU versus the virus with a view beyond the current reality. Arguably the greatest transformation challenge humankind has faced is staring us right at us, right? The greatest transformation challenge we've ever faced. The world has 10 years to cut in half global greenhouse gas emissions and avoid global warming of above 1.5 degrees Celsius. Beyond this point of warming, the more devastating impacts of climate change become irreversible. Put simply, this gives us just over two business cycles, so less than 10 years, to transform every sector of the global economy. This is a positioning from Microsoft. These are incredibly imp important pro propositions. They are declaring to the world that in the next 10 years, every single sector of the global economy must be transformed. Like that's, that's huge. That's where we need EU versus climate, right? So, Transform to Net Zero is this, is this consortium of different companies. Uh, they, they include Mercedes-Benz, Nike, Unilever, Maersk, where they, again, they don't know yet all how to do this, but they have to come together and find solutions, enable their companies to transform it. They have to transform their sector into this new way of doing business, of be existing in the world. They need to come together and start to formulate that. So, here are a few things that I'm taking away from these kind of pioneers. And that is that each of these companies, whether small or big, needs to identify a company's current footprint, 
so that you know what's going on, that you know what your targets are. Determine the company's legacy footprint. Understand we put all that garbage out into the atmosphere. It's our job to take it back down. Communicate them to critical stakeholders, enroll those, commit to specific actions. But also in the fifth point, the, the point I want to just address really quickly and relates to EU versus virus and the capability you've created is invest in the development and deployment of carbon capture solution, whether it's research, startup alliances, make it happen, right? We're going to the moon. We got to figure out how to do that. And we need to have everybody's interest. So startups are hugely important. There's a whole bunch of really interesting incubators that are doing remarkable things about energy. Air Miners is a fantastic uh, small organization that pulls together all these different organizations that are drawing the CO2 out of the atmosphere. They're mining CO2. And in the case of Opus 12, producing fuels and other materials. In the case of Novo Nutrients, they're, trans, they're, they're producing um, proteins out of CO2 and hydrogen that then can be fed to fish. So it solves yet another problem where, you know, we, we use in our fish farms, we, we take all the little fish out of the ocean, grind them up, feed them to the salmon. It doesn't work, right? For each pound of salmon, we take in three pounds of fish out of the ocean. That's not a good idea. Instead, if we can feed them this air-based uh, protein, it solves a whole bunch of really interesting problems. Direct air capture uh, process, uh, you know, approaches. Nature, right, is the big solution, of course. Mycelium is going to be incredibly critical. That's a fungi, mushrooms. They draw, they have the capacity to draw down huge amounts of uh, CO2. So let's get them to work. Agriculture in general, right, industrial agriculture has basically contributed hugely to this destructive reality and look at this picture right on the left hand side you have this this you know man-made way of doing agriculture it's incredibly destructive on the on the right hand side we're finding back to the possibility of of grasses of you know vegetables and things that have deep roots to take out the co2 and sequester into the ground and it generates a very different approach and the good news is you know it's it's highly um, uh, um, labor intensive but we have the labor, but also that's where modern technology comes to play in a new way. You know, robots, interesting little things that can do important things in this kind of more natural place. And then, you know, just to remember, we're human. We like culture. We, we can do this in a beautiful way. We can create whole new ways of producing art to get the artists involved in basically establishing this culture of regeneration, whether it's wind or in the oceans or you know, again, something very beautiful that that connects with producing the kind of energy that we need to do. So the main point I want, I think you see what I was trying to sort of frame for us is that we are now at a point where life on this planet depends on us to do what we sort of are hopefully going to have a lot more conversation about. And I, I think we want to leave uh, our audience with the perspective of saying, so how can I play? You know, how do I, what is my territory in this new regenerative space? that I can play into. And with that as a background, I hope that sort of gives us a, a platform to have what I'm looking forward to having a wonderful conversation over to, to the rest of the team. Let's see, I'm gonna get out of this. I need to. Herman, thank you so much for uh, sharing this slide presentation with us. I think this really helps frame the urgency of this issue, but before we go any further, I would like to introduce our other esteemed guests, uh, members of the panel, We really special. Um, I'd like to begin with Alice Schmidt. So you can look her up on LinkedIn. I mean, she's a globally renowned sustainability expert. She's really proud about saying how she wants to save the planet. And I'm forgetting the German term because it's so bad for that. But let's go a little bit beyond. There's one other thing I found out about her that I think is really important framing this. And that Alice uh, um, is very big into happiness beyond GDP. And I'm thinking about Jingmei uh, from uh, Bhutan and the alignment with this. So we're talking about global because if we're going to fix this and we are going to fix this, right, let's fix everything. Let's fix the other things. Let's go beyond GDP. Let's go for gross national happiness. Now to go beyond this, I'm honored to introduce Karen as well. Karen is another circular economy expert. Like really, we're the, we have a wonk here, someone very technical. But why, I want to share something more than just the technical with our esteemed guests. Karen loves to hug trees. You know what? I do too. And I'll bet there's a lot of us because we like to connect with nature. And I want to inspire the love here that we like to connect with nature. And this is part of the solution. So I'm going to segue a little bit and that we're going to discuss 
you know, solutions, a circular green regenerative. And this is the key part that we're adding, regenerative economy. And what, might, what I'd like to start with is exploring diet, right? What is something we do every day, we eat? And with that, I'd like to hand, hand this over. How can we, as people, this is so scary, right? There's so much we have to do. What about the food we eat right now? Local sources and I'm opening the floor. Thank you, Mike, for this um, enthusiastic introduction. I, I'm I'm very excited to to live up to this. Um, yeah, Alice, um, Herman, I don't know what um, what your diet is. I can only say my diet starts with thinking about what I eat and how much I eat, um, because it's 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 not where it comes from or how much it is. I really consider, do I really need to eat that? Or do I really need this now? And I think this is the first um, part always we should start um, thinking about. Um, it's, it's, it's about considering, is this really what we need? Because um, food waste is a huge problem. Um, and I think uh, a lot of us, and especially in, in, in Western industrialized country, and I can talk about Austria, which produces a lot of food, food waste, uh, like many other European countries. And I think this is a problem um, that, we, that we should consider this um, and not, not waste things. Um, that, that would be my approach to a diet, um, whatever it is. I don't know, Alice and Herman, what do you think about this, Alice? Yeah, so um, that really resonates. And, and thanks, Mike, too, from my side uh, for this lavish introduction. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, it kind of starts in the garden. And I have to say, I'm not actually putting much effort into the garden. It's my partner who does that. Um, but thanks to him, um, we do get seasonal fresh food all the time, organic food. And it has certainly um, you know, made me connect much more to what I eat. And I'm certainly more conscious now uh, in terms of you know, buying beetroot in winter when there's none more in the garden. Uh, but perhaps not uh, pineapples, you know, any, ever. Um, so that's 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 clearly something that has changed. And and I think um, it's to me, for me, the whole you know what I eat starts at where I shop, how I get there, um, you know wh whether I you know take a bag or not. And I, I think I'm quite proud to say that even since I was a child, I've always been taking bags to the supermarket, I really, I would I would do a lot of things before I'd actually buy a bag. Um, it's such a lose-lose situation, right? Your plastic grocery bag that then, you know, sits at home, it just fills up your, 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 your cupboard. And, and what I sort of, from an intellectual point of view, I really like the um, planetary health um, diet. I'm sure some of you are mm. familiar with it. Sort of this idea that sets, you know, much smarter people than me from the Lancet, uh, the, the public health um, journal, and eat have have basically um, very clearly thoughtfully put together a diet that benefits both personal health, individual health, as well as the planet. So they've come up with quite a, a broad range of absolutely delicious foods and the combination and basically you know and guidance on on, on what to eat with what, um, which is still quite flexible. That does that minimizes harm to the planet and maximizes um, health benefits. So great idea. Look that up. Absolutely, Alice. I, I it resonates with me because this is exactly what I was thinking about um, when I heard Herman talking about we're not saving the planet, we're actually saving life on this planet, and life is us. This is all of us. And the same the same goes with the diet, with the planetary diet. It's not about saving the planet with that diet, it's about having a better life. Um, and being more healthy and being more, I mean, there are even, there are even, there is, there is a lot of evidence that the way that our diet um, influences the way our brains work. It's not just the physical health, mm -hmm. it's our mental health that is extremely affected by sugar and all of those other things um, that are around. And, and, and I think this is, this is very relevant to know, and it should start with in early childhood. And as much as many parents are not aware of this, I think in schools, kids should be, it, it, this should be brought to kids' awareness. I think this is something very important that, that everyone does for themselves with the best for the planet. What do you think, Herman? Yeah, to me, uh, what's been really kind of a journey is, is, you know, I think that our modern way of life has disconnected us from our, our nature. Mm. 
just as it has disconnected us from the nature of the land, right? I mean, I used to look at land as basically dirt. And then you scrape it up and you grow something and mm-hmm. things grow out and then you can eat that. Mm-hmm. And I've looked at my body in the same kind of way. And I think to me, realizing that the life of this of life actually exists in the ground, right? It's not dirt. It's, it's earth. It's, it's, there's life in there. Milli- billions, trillions of organisms are living in there without them bad things happen right the atmosphere changes and then we have to introduce toxics and poisons and so we have treated our body in very much the same way than we have treated the land and realizing that we are made of trillions of microorganisms and they are just like the dirt (laughs) they are alive and they are an extension of what goes on on the earth, right? It, it's where tree hugging makes sense. You reconnect with something where re- uh, touching the ground makes sense. We're reconnecting to these microorganisms that are giving us life, both in terms of what they grow and what they produce and then what's going on in our own inner world, right? The, 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 the digestion and all that kind of stuff. So I think linking ourselves back to the nature of who we really are is really fundamental also to how we eat and what we eat and how we connect to where it comes from. And so that, to me, that has been a really important sort of shift in, in my own consciousness. And, and I'd, so I'd like to, sorry, my, your no, turn, please, your please, turn. No, You're I, the just, moderator. The, I told I just, you we don't need <laughs> these that, that much. We will have a great conversation. I, I, we're having a conversation. Please this join. is fun. <laughs> please no, join. Well, I just want to summarize uh, for the audience and we're moving forward that it looks like we're, you know, we have this, uh, we're talking about being very mindful about what you eat. And so Karen's like, not just like thinking about what you eat is very important. And then we have Alice. Now, Alice, you're part of Extinction Rebellion as well. So like, I'm wondering, can you, we fold in some of this? Because we're talking about, uh, you were talking about a planetary dietary health, right? So from an Extinction Rebellion, what I want to know is that like, what's something we can propose that people do? These are very big things, but I know... Part of the EU versus virus, this is to fold back to you, Herman, is that it was a sense of empowerment. That was a call for me, right? It was like, wow, we've got a problem and I want to get with like minds to fix this, to do something while we're all locked in in our apartments. And that's what unfolded during EU versus virus, which, by the way, I think should never end. I think this is like we're saying now is the coldest um, summer in 125 years. I think we need to think that this effort continues, right? We've got some work to do. But to go back to the to go back, Alice, Extinction Rebellion, our diet. Tell us what. what okay, well, happen. so yes, yeah, so what I do with the Extinction Rebellion is um, to basically help them measure their impact. Yeah, and and this is hard. Um, I can tell you because it's a movement, wonderful movement, um, but very diverse. Um, I think what what Extinction Rebellion is about is to really get people to understand the systems dynamics, but also the need for systems change, right? It's exactly what what Herman and Karen have been mentioning, this interdependence of of humans with animals, with plants, and and this sort of this this essence of keeping all of these ecosystems basically together for the survival of our species. And I think that's what that's what, what what keeps sort of keeping me awake at night is why people still don't understand. A lot of people still don't understand that's in their very own self-interest hmm. to save the planet. And by doing so, they're saving themselves and everything else is suicidal. And even, you know, the, gen- Jerry, uh, the UN um, Secretary General has said that recently, that's quite strong language for someone in, in his position. And, and I, I don't know um, if you're familiar with this concept, but the whole um, ecosystem services, so the planet has been has been providing services for us right oh i like yeah. it excuse me whoa 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 because whoa. we've got yeah, some yeah. business people here ecosystem services yeah. indeed because, yeah exactly this goes back to what herman was saying about sap because I'll, I'll make a point <laughs> and then drop out that out of all of the the companies you mentioned i see the most powerful change agent can actually be an sap or microsoft with enterprise um erp systems right this is basically the how businesses are run, that carbon, the mindfulness of carbon is part of this whole workflow. And then I'll leave it that, uh, ecological services, this is beautiful, please tell us more. Yeah, and so, I mean, to really keep this short, um, so three types of services, provisioning services, providing food, wood, medicine, etc., energy, right, solar, wind. Then yeah. secondly, regulating stuff like filtering water, um, you know, pollinating crops through bees, um, regulating the climate. 
And then thirdly, also sort of spiritual, personal growth, cultural aspects, right? I mean, we love to, to be in nature and a lot of us have discovered that, uh, um, you know, more recently during the, the lockdowns. And now basically for, for, for thousands of years, the planet has been providing these services to us for free without fail. Um, and for the longest time, interestingly, that has actually benefited us. So for us to kind of abuse the, the planet has been good for us. We now live longer, we live better than we ever did before. But we've now reached a turning point where abusing the, these services and you know, basically taking them in for free uh, um, any longer has led to, to the opposite, right? We'll, we'll see reduced lifespans. We'll, this, we, are benef we are damaging our own health already. Yeah, or we're killing ourselves through pollution. Um, eight million people die each year from air pollution alone. Yeah, that's even before climate change. Um, you know, that's 1.5 compared to 1.5 that have died from COVID so far. So I'll stop there. But I think this is a really important thing that people need to uh, understand more. Yeah. Not bypassing you, Herman, but to go to Karen, I want to maintain this theme of connectedness. And I'm actually going back to the hugging of trees, actually, <laughs> because of this, because we're talking about feelings. So to connect this, that we're talking this interconnectedness, and we were talking about mycelia, that within the forest floor, the mycelia, if anyone wants to research uh, the forest internet, right, is <laughs> actually, it's more than just a white fibrous material. It's a communication medium. So Karen, you are a circular economy expert. And can you tell us about like hugging the tree and how this can relate to circular? <laughs> well, that's quite a stretch. Thank you for this question, Mike. Um, um, what um, circular economy is also about is systems. And it's, um, mm. and in that case, it's not a linear system, it's a circular system. But also, it's not about one closed loop that for one product, for one company, for one service, I close my own loop. It only works if we think in systems and we create value systems rather than value chains for one company. We create systems, which means we are connected with our, let's say, um, market peers, with um, research institutions, with our um, suppliers with our consumers, with um, secondary material platforms, um, to keep things within circles or loops, um, to, to reuse them and use them and use them again, because this is what we are losing right now. We are producing material, we are sourcing, we're producing material, we are using it and we are throwing actual value away. It escapes into the oceans, it escapes into the um, into land environment, and all in, in Europe, we incinerate it, we burn it. So we lose a lot of material that takes a lot of environmental and social capital away at the stage of sourcing it. Because we use, as Alice said, we are using those services. And this is actually a capital that we are using. This is the environmental capital, the social capital we live from, this is a value. And we take out those resources and, and use them and throw them up. And we, we use them up and throw them away, which is crazy on a finite planet because where should that leave us? And everyone who has one sensible thought in their heads should realize that this does not work. And maybe in the 50s, 60s and 70s, when we designed this kind of economy, this was still something that could be looked at that way, but currently we are at the borders and have crossed some of our planetary boundaries already, and we cannot keep on using resources, using those services that the planet provides us with forever and ever, because this is going to destroy ourselves. And the circular economy or a regenerative economy um, is the only system or economic system or economic um, model that can save our life in a good way on this planet. And yes, we can keep on living here and some of us can, but not everyone and not in the same quality if we keep on doing what we're doing currently. So we have to change this in order to make a good living still possible because this planet actually gives us everything that we need for the past thousand years. It has provided life with everything that 
that we can dream of. We have air, we have water, we have plants, we have biodiversities, beautiful species. We have materials that we can use for housing, for living, for everything. We are the generation now that has to become aware and here we are with the emotions. We have to become aware that we are part of this planetary system. It's not about what's in for me. It's not about an egocentric mindset any longer. It's about an ecocentric mindset, which means that we all are aware that we are interconnected with other human beings, but also with the systems in this planet. And I think once you come to this kind of mindset, your life becomes so rich because it's not just about you yourself and what you want and what you've got. It's about what you share, what you have in common, what you can enjoy uh, and what you can live from. And this is something that I have experienced in the EU versus virus very, very much. This joy of sharing a mutual purpose, a mutual experience. Yeah. This was- Oh, excuse me to interrupt. Oh yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, yeah. This is the beauty of it. And I, this, I'm with you. I don't want to let it go. This is why- The I'm joy of solving problems with others and, and to like, the, the, to to remove these negative internal voices. Oh, you know, all these countries can't get along together. My yes. God, by being in EU versus virus, I yeah. witnessed that it's yeah. the rest yeah. of you witnessed. Yeah. yeah. Everyone getting yeah. along and driven to yeah. purpose. Yes. My God, that's what got me through March and yeah. April yeah. actually was that experience yeah. or I would have cried. Absolutely. Cracked. Same here. Same here. I can only, this, this is, I'm, I, I'm still filled with this kind of experience that I had with meeting so many people who, who collectively united under this purpose. And I think this is what the idea of Europe is, what it should be about. And I, am, I was so happy to see this because what I see on the media or what we all can see is constant quarrel of our political leaders about the most stupidest thing and totally um, selfish interests politically self or, or yeah politically or, or national selfish interests and in the EU versus virus it was the opposite it was open it was cross-border it was collective it was it was the complete opposite and it made me so happy to see this Dur during the closed borders and we all couldn't travel any longer it was it was filled with love really yes. so what was one thing I'm picking up from everyone's conversations that looks like and we're going to shift a little bit. I was going to go into old age, but I think I've, we've got something here to do. And what I'm identifying here is vocabulary. Okay. And there's one key. I want to start with one that we we're talking about supply chains. And then we went to supply circles. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about something we can do, it looks like vocabulary mm -hmm. is a very important because from mm -hmm. vocabulary comes consciousness right mm -hmm. there intertwined. And mm -hmm. when we change consciousness, mm -hmm. we change the world. Mm -hmm. So Maybe we can discuss this more that how we can get to this. Like I'm all thinking supply chain and I'm kind of like, oh, wait, supply circle. Yeah. Let's go. Right. right. Let's get some terms. Right. Like how how do we develop the language so we can all communicate the reality we need to create? And let's start with <laughs> supply chain versus supply circle. <laughs> I'm well, happy actually, to come in here. Sorry, Alice. <laughs> go ahead. You know, basically, while you were speaking uh, and, you know, obviously I agree with what you said. Uh, there's this uh, sentence that I think uh, Kate Roloff said uh, some time ago was that came to mind and that really uh, stuck with me this there is no way right well we, we can't throw things away there is no way on our ah. yeah that's a nice one isn't it mm. yeah. there is no away there yeah. is no away and it's true when you think about it right and mm -hmm. and and the other thing, um, and you know, we, we can get straight back to terminology, but we keep thinking we need to do something new, but actually we just need to look across, yeah. um, you know, the Atlantic border, across, you know, the ocean basically, and find a lot of countries, a lot of people, billions of people, in fact, a lot of countries that are living circular lifestyles because they're poor. And actually we used to live more or less these life lifestyles until not that long ago. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we just love to think that we're great and, and, and we need to find sort of new challenges uh, to, to, to new problems, but it's not just that. Yeah? Uh, I think that's quite important. And then when it, when it comes to terminology and language, broadly speaking, I think we really need to communicate these win-wins or even win-win-wins, right? We can create benefits for the environment, for society and for the economy at the same time. Uh, some people call this multi-solving. 
um, that's a bit of a mouthful, but but really win win wins. I think that's that's really what we can. So this positive language, right? Positive approach, communi communicating to people what's in it for them. Because let's let's face it, a lot of us are you know very sort of want to be good people and are full of purpose and ethics and all of that. And others are might be just more self interested, but that's fine because it's actually very much in their self interest to do something differently to change their behavior. So Herman, so as an overview, like as our tra for our transformation to net zero, like how could we drop some of this vocabulary? In? And by the way, Alice, I'm going to use there is no way. I, I've got a way. Like every time I hear throw it away, it gives me an opportunity to say there is no way. What's the answer, Mike? I don't know. Just think about that. <laughs> but Herman, please. So this transform so, net zero and what we've discussed and the EU versus virus. What are your thoughts? So, so I mean, I. I I'm filled with thoughts. This is a great conversation. Um, speaking of, uh, there's no way the, the first person that I ever heard about talking about that was in, in the 90s was William McDonough, who together with uh, Brown Guard wrote a book called Cradle to Cradle. To me, still sort of the original thinker. <gasps> oh, oh, no, 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 not Cradle to Grave, Cradle to Cradle. Right. And that was a fundamental, because if you start to say Cradle to Cradle, you know, whatever mm -hmm goes away becomes the cradle of the next thing, right? So that's the fundamental behind circularity, circular thinking. Um, and the other thing that they said, talked about is growth, right? They were saying growth is not bad in itself, right? Growth, growing something good, a tree is abundant, a tree is verdant, a tree is not worried about growth. It, it grows a million, you know, seeds and that's a good growth right so you know out of that mindset out of that cradle to cradle circular mindset comes a whole new way of being right and that's where i, I love what you're pointing at uh, mike in terms of the criticality of language and the criticality of narrative what is the story that within which we live and do we share that story that's where i also think it's really critical that we shift from the notion of sustainability to regeneration that's a mind that's a language a piece of language is we need to step it up we need to regenerate because we have to you know the destruction has been to a level where we need to find ways to draw down those are important pieces of language circular regeneration right sustain that the, i also am not that fond of climate neutral because we actually in the regenerative thing we need to be climate active or something you know yes. neutrality is no longer enough neutrality is like sustainability we've messed it up it's it's no longer viable the way it is. We need to revitalize it. So I love this notion of bringing new language into this and sharing it and having people join us in rethinking the narrative that is actually then productive in the direction of saying, well, then let's focus on what it takes to be circular. Let's focus on what it takes to be reconnected, to be regenerative, because that then drives the action, right? You versus virus was, a very aggressive perspective. We have a virus, let's go up against it. That was good, that's a piece of language. Now, what are we gonna do about the climate? How do we language that so that people can get excited about how they can contribute to it, how they can innovate into that? So I really enjoy that sort of rethink uh, that you know, Extinction Rebellion, other important uh, converse, you know, lang piece of language, it is extinction. Let's not step away from the notion yeah. that going extinct it, you know one of the things i tried to say that in my introduction is there may still be time to act it kind of puts us to sleep to me at least it's like there may still you know so you know go about your business how do we activate it and say this is our moment and that's where i love you know what the ceo of walmart say when i see these characters do it and you know it's it's a risky thing corporations have been part of what has gotten us into the trouble Right. And so we could also just say, we don't want to deal with them. Right. Uh, you know, they're, they're, but I think they're around all, many of us work inside of them and the possibility of actually transforming them, realizing that in the next 10 years, they all have to transform. How can we participate in recrafting them so that they support a livable planet? Right. That's the opportunity here. You mentioned Doug McMillan, and I'd like to bring up to the audience, if they're not familiar with how profound that it is, it's not just that he's the CEO of Walmart. Doug McMillan, in, in surveys over the past few years, is the highest regarded CEO. So for that class of person, right, he, when he says someone, people in his class or clique or how a group, social group 
listen. So this is very profound. Um, just okay. want to yeah. add that you were mentioning Doug McMillan and that, that so we're, we can give them the language, right? Yeah. I mean, this is what I want to see is that I, and, like and maybe a year, we don't right? see supply chain in these communications. We see someone like Doug McMillan saying supply circle. And to add one, ask one more question, Herman, regeneration is very important. What are some more, some more vocabulary for that? Right, Some, something we can drop in. I like that waste. I, there is I, waste. I quite, there is I mean, no let's waste. think yeah. about it. There's yeah. a lot of good language coming our way, but I think personally drawdown is really a good piece of language. I think uh, air drawdown. miners, I love I love the idea of mining the air, right? We are, we've been digging down into the ground, mining the ground. We now have all the CO2 out there. Why don't we take it out and do something with it? Either recreating the kind of things, fuels that, yeah, they'll return back into the atmosphere, but it's a bringing it out of the ground where it took 70 million years to produce the oil and gas and, and coal that we've been pulling out for the last 250 years, right? We, we, we are, the earth kind of covered it all up for 70 million years during that particular period in, in the life of this planet. And we took 200 years to pull much of it out and stick it into the atmosphere. No wonder we have the problem we have, right? So any, any language that opens up to these kind of realizations, I love anything related to reconnecting to microorganisms. Uh, microorganisms. I think that's going to be a huge solution, whether it's personal health or the health of our planet. Um, so language related to domesticating microorganisms, right? I see you drinking something that comes out of the domestication. Of <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are good things. So let's fight back. You know, that fish food th story that I told, that's putting microorganisms to work to take CO2 out, convert it into, into um, uh, proteins. Those are microorganisms that do that, produce bodies that then can be fed to fish. Those are, those are really interesting concepts. So could this allude to, and then I'll, I'll drop out a little bit because this conversation is so wondering, but so wonderful, but um, could it be greater, and this ties into vocabulary, could it be greater understanding that humans, that we really are super organisms, right? Especially if you do some studies of the micro, gut microbiome and you realize that us without these other little things, this whole, the, the, the amount of microorganisms in our body exceeds the amount of cells in our body, like crazy things like this, that when people well, start and understanding cells that- Cells, you know, there there hundreds of microorganisms in each one of our cells, right? Without them, we could yes. produce, we could not convert oxygen into what we need to to be, right? That it's produced. I mean, those are really important realizations. And just I, to go back I, to this connection, and I'll be done. But like when we're hugging the tree and we're talking about extinction rebellion, that we are super organisms. That we, it's just learning what we really are. We've forgotten. It sounds like. We are so intimately connected together yeah. to and not deny, like, but to embrace that. I would really like also to see the, the narrative go um, move from the mecha mechanical worldview that we have currently, that we can adjust everything mechanically um, or with technology more to, an, to a worldview on this is an organism. We are part of a big living pulsating organism, which is our planet and its systems. And we are one of the organisms that is living on this planet within those systems and to feel this interconnectedness and to have more of a, um, a biological view on things and not the, with, with, which means growing, um, to a certain extent, and then it's dying, um, whether this is in economy or, or, or elsewhere, because there is no infinite growth in nature. And if we tackle the whole growth def, um, discussion that we have in, in, in economy, uh, and a lot of people are scared to death about the, the picture of <gasps> what happens if there is no unlimited growth any longer. Well, there isn't on a finite planet with finite resources. That's just as simple as that. But if we if we see ourselves, our, our organizations, our processes, our products, our services as living as part of a living system, it becomes natural that things come and go and they grow and they flourish and then they go back into the system again and they come back again. So this is it's it's natural. That, and, and I mean, even Jeff Bezos said that. Amazon is going to die one day because it's not made to be around forever. 
which of course no company course. is made forever. Um, and even the biggest things die. We have learned this through the with the dinosaurs. So why why should we if it's not the dinosaurs? I'd like to pick up on the point of t on tech fixes mm -hmm. um, because I mean obviously we're in a tech space here, and I probably risk making myself very unpopular, and I'm a bit of a party pooper, but. Um, I do think that we need to realize that technology can help us to an extent, and there's no other way. Um, but essentially, we'll need to change our behavior. I think that there's no way around this, and there's loads of technologies that can help us change our behavior and that uh, can help us to emit less. Um, and it's good that we have things like carbon capture and storage on the way to become sort of big, but. The, we need to realize that these kind of technologies also essentially um, benefit the fossil fuel industry. And I mean, they're often these operations are often owned by the fossil fuel industry. Um, they act as incentives to not keep a fossil fuel, so oil, gas, and coal in the ground as we should, but to actually keep um, keep burning them. And and I, again, I'm not saying you know tech is bad. I'm just saying we need to be very clear about that. And at the end of the day, we, we really need to change behavior. And that might be a bit uncomfortable, even if and, and that's why I think it's also important to realize that the big benefits this has and what's in it for us. Yeah, the, the better health, the better well being, the more pleasant, I don't know, walks to school when um, the air is cleaner and not full of noisy planes, for example. How many tons of carbon have we generated by the Zoom conference? Okay, oh, I, I hate to be a party pooper, but oh, let's be yeah. let's have a little reality check mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. And that this is this is uh, basically you know data centers are uh, powered by coal and natural gas. Mm -hmm. Probably is, less than us flying. Herman flying in from the U.S., uh, me flying in from Austria. Um, yeah. Everyone's going to whatever Brussels, Germany. So and, and, there, and there are options of how that energy is produced, right? So we're, yes. we're moving in that direction. I think Alice is making a supremely important mm -hmm. point yes. about behavioral change and about technology and about all that. And we could spend another hour, I'm sure, at least on that. Um, I think to me, if you, you know, kind of recall sort of where I started is we are out of time. And so that's just what at least my perspective is. And so behavioral change takes a lot of time. Uh, particularly on the individual level, I think if we can change uh, um, institutions within which humans are called mm -hmm. to behave differently, the way a village is organized, the way a city is organized, the way a school is organized, the way then people adjust to those. So institutional change to me is really fundamental. Companies are different, right? So I take a lot of hope from the kind of things I talked about with, with Microsoft and companies like that because I'm looking for where do we have the biggest lever, the biggest impact, the fastest. And so I agree, you know, I drive an electric car. I think it's not a good thing to do, right? It, I mean, the way the batteries are produced, I've been driving electric cars since 1992. You know, so I've been in that space because I know we need to transition into something different, but it's, it's crap, right? I mean, it's not... It's not, it doesn't solve the actual problem, right? It, we're going to shift. People are going to be in a totally different place 80 years from now, right? Mm -hmm. but, but the point is urgency. The point is where do we have the highest lever? And that's where I'm looking to the bigger car, car, you know, companies. That's where I look to these more institutional things. I look at Extinction Rebellion, where we have massive numbers of people connecting within an institutional, I call this sort of an institutional context, to rethink their behavior, right? And so just a point, you know, I totally agree with you, Alice. We're going to do a lot of stuff that is not perfect, but we got to do stuff to yeah. start addressing these really significant issues, even if not perfect yet. Absolutely. So Herman, are you saying we do it? We, we can add, add some elements of startup style to this. Basically that we know do, that we might do. make some mistakes. We're going to fail, iterate, yeah. and keep driving to improvement, right? Like we did in EU versus Our viral. greatest hope, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, yes, absolutely. This is why it excites me about this, this connection to EU versus virus, right? Is all these people who are mobilized, ready to go, how can we draw at least some of them into this fundamental, hugely important reality that we are facing? I mean, I'd like to, just like to say, um, trying is fine and trial and error is great, um, but 
with the urgency we have, we should, we can't really afford many big mistakes, right? And I think there's some mistakes that we've know that, that we know that we've been making for decades, like subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, for example, right? Um, I mean, that just needs to go. There's just, you know, we, we know it, we have known it. Um, and and the sort of the lobbying, the corporate power has just been so strong um, that unfortunately we haven't managed to overcome it. And I think we just need to face it. We need to really keep things in proportion. Um, and no, we, we can't be perfect, but we really net, need to get our act together now. And we have the, we have all the evidence. I mean, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that I think we can all agree on that, right? The evidence Absolutely. is there, and there's this bigger political economy piece um, that needs to happen. Um, and, and and movements like like the Extinction Rebellion are great, um, but they need to build on something. And, and I really hope that, um, you know, COVID has shown us that drastic action is possible when, excuse my German, um, shit hits the fan, we can act. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm hoping for, even trusting in. <laughs> uh, is there a German word for that? Because it's wonderful how Germany is able, German you language. Don't want to go there. <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> we probably when we're going back to vocabulary like we're these are things that may evolve right we may actually come up with a word for shtf right because that's something that's going to be that's not a black swan event right now the, this is this is a value in the wrong place <laughs> it may be a value in the wrong place you know i love that yeah. Spe yeah. speaking of black swan events here's a cool book oh, green swans, green swans. Uh, john alkin oh, do we have time oh give us a, a blur what's a green swan event oh, as opposed to a black swan event um, great it's Fabulous. it's the subtitle is the the coming boom of the of in regenerative capitalism it's basically a critique of existing capitalism it's by the person who invented the three uh, 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 triple, um, bottom line. triple bottom line people planet profit mm -hmm. yeah yeah. I like that sequence. Uh, we're getting hey, close to closing, but I'd like to add something. This is, I, I know a hardware investor from Brink. Uh, so they develop hardware in China. His name is Bay McLaughlin. And in those circles, he's quite big for developing hardware. And what he told me, he said, Mike, there's a fortune to be made on F-bombing the planet. And so why I'm closing with this is we're talking about fixing the planet. And this was the profanity used was to inject the urgency, right? You don't say we're going to fix the planet. We've got to. Right. Term I don't want to use fix this our right system. now. But fix our system. The planet. It's not fixing. It's like we've got to unblank it. We've got to regenerate, right? We need to change our language. We need to connect. We need to learn the lessons from EU versus virus, how it's a continued effort to solve problems. And um, I think I'm getting a message. Uh, I'm getting a message. It's also stop. <laughs> yes. So last words. Uh, let's go. Karen, what was, what's your last words for this? Um, now is the time. We've got everything we need. We've got the knowledge. We've got the technologies in place. We've got the money. Um, We've got everything we need, so let's go. There is nothing that keeps us from, from starting today. And I'm, I'm happy to see so many amazing things here happening here. Um, and now um, again here on EU versus virus, it's amazing. I'm, I'm very grateful to be a part of that. Beautiful. Alice, go. Um, it's not green versus gross. And uh, we can actually have our cake and eat it. Um, but the one thing we really need to um, get better at is true cost accounting. So we need to pay the real price for, you know, burning fossil fuels, for taking planes rather than trains, etc. Yeah. So that we just need to factor all of that in, and then I think we sort it. Okay, Herman, final words. Uh, you've created an incredible platform. Um, this is happening. This is inevitable. Join. I thank you all very much for your time today. Let's let's get together. And for anyone watching, you know, we're in this together. Let's solve it together. And let's stop throwing things away. We can change our language. Thank you. There is no way. Thank you, Mike. There is no way.